Welcome to the Drum Chatter Podcast for the week of June 18th. My name is Tom Burritt. I'm Shane Griffin. I'm Dave Gerhart. And on the line with us is Jay Cummings and Adam Groh. We have two guests for this week. And uh, thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. All right, so who's getting us started? I'll, I'll kick it off. So, right. so this week what we decided to do was... Um, Number one, bring back the podcast and uh, invite two guys that have written some great articles on the Drum Chatter uh, blog. The first uh, article is an article by um, Jake Cummings. Jake was a grad student at Cal State Long Beach, and he wrote an article about solo marimba playing, uh, where he talks about um, how to make uh, marimba more accessible out into the public and has some ideas about that. So maybe you can kind of summarize that, Jake, and let's let's start with that. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, and thanks for all that you guys do. I think you do a great job connecting everybody in the percussion community. Um, but anyways... Thanks. Uh, thanks. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Anyways, the post that I put up, um, it was originally... I started thinking about... Um, I, I have a lot of parents come up to me. I teach at a handful of high schools here in Southern California. And I have a lot of parents come up to me after they see their kids play. And they're really impressed with everything and they really like it. Um, but they basically have no idea what the marimba is. They've never really seen one before. They're really kind of confused by it and its function and what you can really do with it. So I started thinking, why this instrument that um, has been an integral part of my education for the past almost decade now, um, is so foreign to so many people out there. So I was thinking about where I've played marimba, especially solo marimba, before, and what I came up with was a lot of recitals and clinics, um, which basically translated to me either playing or watching somebody else play um, marimba for an audience of only marimbas or percussionists for that matter. Um, so then it kind of started making sense that people, they never see this instrument. They, never, they don't really know what it is. Um, and one of the comments that really surprised me was, uh, Dr. Barrett, you mentioned that most of your playing now is actually for the general public. Is that right? Um, maybe most is um, going a bit too far, but I do, <laughs> I'm finding myself playing a lot more for the general public, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Which is great. Um, it just surprised me how confused people are, and I just tried to start thinking about ways to get the instrument itself in front of a, of a broader art, uh, audience, and not just other marimba players and other percussionists, which seems to be uh, the majority of the case. So I'll leave it there if anybody wants to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I'll add to that is, I mean, I, I, I totally agree that many or a significant portion of um, recitals and concerts are, you know, are done for people who play the instrument. You know, Casey is a good example. Days of Percussion is a good example. Uh, even recitals within any sort of university uh, program um, is a good example. And I, I just think that could, could be that you know we're still in that early stages of an instrument's development where um, you know we're still learning as a community. And so I think that's probably the main benefit is you have lots of students and. Um, more and more players. I remember, you know, lately I've been thinking a lot back to when I first started in the late 80s. You know, there were Maltech, Malice didn't exist, uh, Innovative Percussion didn't exist even as a company, and you know, I remember, <clears throat> you know, not knowing that many people that were professional players, uh, certainly weren't as many students, and I think about where we come from that point, um, and it's, it's pretty astounding to see that sort of happen over that period of time. So, I don't know, maybe it's just that we're still in that phase where we're educating ourselves and we're developing at such a rate inside our own circles that, um, you know, we have to, you know, keep doing that to a certain degree until we can really bring it out. But I think the, the bigger issue is that they're just, you know, what kind of demand is there? You know, I was just at the Lee Howard Stevens seminar, and all those recitals are open to the public for a, just a little bit of a donation to the hall, and I think there were, like, two people from the public that came you know, it's just not, we just haven't reached that point yet where a lot of people want to know us, and certainly the musical culture in the, in the States right now, at least, isn't one that's in high demand of, of the marimba. So those are just some quick off-the-hat thoughts I had. And maybe well, that's the... Oh, sorry, Shane. 
Well, that's okay. I was just going to say, I was, how can we go about creating the demand? Because every time I played in public, um, I, the example that's jumping to my mind is a wedding I played at. Everyone who didn't know what it yeah. was came up after and asked, and there was like this huge ordeal, and it was great because of the exposure of the instrument, even in a small venue. I mean, it's only like a 75-person wedding, but there was a, a large percentage wanted to know more about it and how it worked and you know, all, all that great stuff. So I wonder, uh, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to figure out is where do we get to that tipping point if it... Because you said there wasn't a demand, and I think that it's less of that, and it's more of a lack of knowledge. And I think, well, obviously, we're still in the infancy. I'm thinking about uh, instruments like the saxophone, for example. Like, not an old instrument. I mean, it's been around in the public eye longer than us, and it's got a very high demand um, in more accepted, you know, non-artist playing for artist venues than we do. So. Yeah, no, that's good. That's, that's a good example, actually, a comparison. I remember playing a wedding once, and uh, the, I can remember pl I was playing Bach, and the, and the groomsmen were going by down the hall, and I heard one joke. They were like, what is this, a Caribbean wedding or something? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that's just like a context, even though I was playing Bach, right? right. So that's just, that's just a context. I, I think, you know, uh, when I played in Victoria Bach Festival just a few weeks ago, that was probably 100, 150 people there. And that was just like, was like a free noon concert in, in almost pretty much a bar is where it was. <laughs> and um, people love, I mean, they love seeing it. They love watching it. They're fascinated by it. So I think it could become popular, I think, just from a visual perspective. So, Shane, that kind of refers to what you were talking about, that once people see it, you know, I think there actually could be some demand or at least um, some hype about it, you know. Um, and I don't want to be trapped in weddings our whole life. Obviously, we want to break right, that not, mold at some point. But yeah, it is a good exposure point. Right. That's not going to do it either. I think. I think we're really looking at the presenters. You know, I think uh, my friends at the Victoria Bach Festival. I think they really like the freshness that it, that it gives their festival. You know, and I've been back three or four years now, and um, I think talking to presenters, and making sure that they're the ones that you know are that see the value in it and see that it can be very accessible and very um, exciting to watch and a different sort of taste to what they're presenting. How do we educate people to, to let them know or to get them to know what a marimba is? Because I'm sure at the Bach Festival people said, oh, that's a great vibraphone or oh, that's a great xylophone or, you know, how, yeah. do, we get, how do we get people to know that this is a marimba and it's not a vibraphone? Right, and then, like, how many people understand the difference between a soprano and a very saxophone? Probably more. Right, and understand the difference between a xylophone and a marimba and a vibraphone. Um, yeah, I don't know that there's an easy answer to that, obviously, but um, a lot of people ask me that question, and you just, you know, you hope that you hope that uh, when you tell them, they remember, or they tell their friends, or whatever. I don't know. Shane. <laughs> 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 I, I really didn't. I, I my thought escaped me. So, uh, I mean, we have we have ragtime, and that's you know the everyone hears ragtime and they think of xylophone first off. If you know, if they see an instrument actually, that looks like a mallet instrument. Dave, if I could just jump in on that, I think you know we we had an example, and you know in the golden age of the xylophone, the xylophone players were they were they were the rock stars of the day. You know. And right. I think that that kind of that might be a good example just to look at in this discussion because back then, um, ragtime was big and the xylophone was perfect, you know, for that. Yeah. And yeah. there were some amazing players, and even in the early early recordings, right? What we what we know is that the xylophone of all the instruments in the orchestra recorded the best with the technology of the day. You know right. I mean? it, it was uh, it just it was very well captured with the limited technology they had. So it was kind of like all the stars aligned back then. Um, just for that decade or so. Um, well, that's what I was going to say, is we don't have that, that benefit of being the only recordable instrument anymore. I mean, with wax cylinders, it was perfect because it was right. one of the few instruments that could be captured, whereas now we don't have that luxury of being the only effectively recorded instrument, which, so we've got to find, what I'm, all I'm saying is we've got to find ways to break into the market um, in, a, in a public eye. And right, because then you have vibraphone, and you have Lionel Hampton, and you have Milt Jackson. Mm -hmm. you know, everyone knows Lionel Hampton. Like, my parents know Lionel Hampton, you know. So right. 
So how do we how do we get you know the Keiko Abe's or I mean Evelyn Glennie is obviously a good example of people in the in the general population knowing a percussionist. Well, you know the 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 main jazz players that we remember, um, you know maybe even Gary Burton, a more recent one. He you know he made the mainstream in his field in jazz. You know. I think that's what it's going to take until someone can get into the mainstream. I mean, Evelyn Glenn is a good example, but obviously she doesn't play just marimba. Right. You know, and she's played on she's played on the le- late night show Letterman. You know, I remember that episode. You know, right. um, so but until she does, someone like her does that only. You know, uh, both there on the Letterman show and with the New York Phil. And, you know, I'm not sure. You know. Well, I, and I want to use that kind of as a transition point because I think that was a critical point that she doesn't just play marimba, and I. And I think it kind of transitions well into the Adams uh, response article to Jake in in um, the being accessible. But he was discussing good music is good music is good music. Um, so Adam, do you have any thoughts on how we can make sure that the music we're we're choosing helps us become more received by the public? It seemed like that was something you're passionate about. Yeah. Um, well, I also just want to say thanks to you guys for bringing me on. Um, long-time listener, first-time guest. <laughs> but, uh, hey, no, one, no one's ever said that on our podcast. Uh, <laughs> no, um, actually, as you guys were talking, one thing that I, <clears throat> that I noticed is that um, I think maybe we're looking at it kind of backwards in that, you know, we talk about Lionel Hands and we talk about the Green Brothers. Both of them, or both of those people... Um, had an association with a style of music. And the marimba, you know, it has these some associations, um, but nothing that's made it mainstream. You know, the xylophone got popular because ragtime got popular. The yeah. vibraphone got noticed because jazz became popular. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the marimba doesn't have that kind of link to one specific thing that those instruments have. And maybe... I don't know what kind of music, you know, could be coming down the pipe that would give the marimba a chance to really jump on that. But, um, you know, I think that's something that probably helped both of those other instruments kind of get where they are um, and kind of gave them a little bit of a head start. The other thing I was thinking while you guys were talking, kind of in the same vein, is that, you know, the marimba hasn't really been um, a concert instrument for that long. And besides being attached to some kind of music, you know, we haven't... I think a lot of the ways that people find out about instruments is they either play them in their, you know, earlier years or they have kids who play them. I mean, now it's like you have parents who say, oh, you know, the trumpet, I played that when I was in band. Mm -hmm. Well, until maybe this current generation, not many kids are growing up playing marimba. You know, there's probably a lot of high schools out there that don't own a marimba or a marimba that's maybe worth owning. Passable. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, peop- I think as it kind of trickles down to those lower levels where it can reach a broader audience that way, you know, then in maybe 10 years, as discouraging as that might be, then you're going to have those parents who are saying, oh, I played in marching band in high school. I was in the front ensemble. I, there's a marimba concert, you know, at the community right. theater. I'm going to bring my kids because I remember playing marimba. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Cause that's, that's the other big thing that we have a disadvantage of is, you know, a concert marimba is $15,000 mm. where, you know, you can go out and buy a $400 flute and, you know, my sister-in-law played flute. You know, everyone played flute because it was an accessible instrument. But I think the marching band world is is really a place that um, we're going to hit a lot of people, get a lot of people playing the instrument. Definitely. But that's a good point, Adam, yeah. I really like the point about um, each of the previous instruments we talked about being linked to a, um, a style, too. Because I was even taking that parallel outside of percussion back to the saxophone, which we were talking about earlier. And <laughs> obviously... Um, the saxophone didn't quite make the cut in the orchestral repertoire for quite a while, but it made its thing because jazz got popular, mm-hmm. and that's where it got noticed. So I like that that point. Yeah, and I, and I wonder, in a similar uh, perspective, if, you know, we can certainly bring 
the marimba probably to a more wider public audience if we adjust our style because you know we can play a lot of different styles, and maybe that's a way to go. Um, and that would certainly help the marimba's exposure. However, I don't know that you know. I think the marimba we're talking about is more connected to the, the contemporary literature of the day. You know, um, which all of us know. Uh, isn't um, not just is not just an art that's limited in popularity for the marimba. It's limited in popularity for any instrument that chooses to play in that style. So, so I guess the question is, do we do we latch on to the, the style of today, which is sort of contemporary art music, in a similar mm -hmm. way that saxophone might maybe did with jazz, or you know ragtime did with or xylophone did with ragtime? Um, is it going to happen in a similar way? I guess is my thought or question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's kind of where my um, some of my posts in response to Jake's original article, and then my um, my post about accessibility kind of picked up because um, I really, you know, I think that a lot of the discussion following Jake's post kind of got into this like, okay, well, you know, the only way for people to really get into the marimba is if we start playing. Bach, or if we play, it seemed like everybody kind of was talking around the idea of like tonal music being, you know, what people are going to latch on to. And, you know, so my post eventually, I just was sitting there thinking about it and just kind of thought, you know, I, I don't know, maybe this is just my own thing, that I don't really buy the whole tonal music as the only thing that people can like. And, you know, I think that um, we just need to play the music that we care about, that we like, and, you know, show people that it's worth listening to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I don't think we have to do just one or the other, right? I mean, yeah. I think our instrument is versatile enough. And, I, you know, I keep waiting for the day when I see it very popular. Uh, maybe this is how it happens, like in a rock band. I know there's a few, I know of a few players that have, you know, are trying or have tried to do that at some point to latch it into that style. Um, you know, we continually hear it. We hear it more continually, and even soundtracking. You know, um, mostly in a minimalist sort of style. Um, so it is creeping in there. And I can remember just you know, two thousand nine or ten, a big article on the front page of the New York Times. You know, on the Sunday Times article. So maybe it's just gonna. You know, we have the the larger we grow our community base. You know, maybe uh, everyone does what they do with it. And we uh, achieve this goal somehow collectively. It could be too. Yeah, and one of the things I was thinking about also, and and <clears throat> I think one of the things we should be teaching more in school is how to actually talk about the music that we're doing and educate people. Not only just like this is a marimba, but you know, here's the style of music that we're playing. Because I think you know, like Adam was saying, mu good music's good music, and everyone's going to listen to that. But um, I think when you can go up on stage and you can talk about the piece you're going to play and talk about what influenced the piece and, and what, the, what they're about to hear, then the audiences are going to be much more um, willing to listen to the music than, oh, yeah, this is another 20th century piece or 21st century piece. Yeah, yeah and I think... I, sorry, go ahead, Shane. Well, yeah, and I was just going to say, I also think we need to remember that the, the general audiences can only learn to like that music if we let them like the a, a non music example just from other trends is I, I think to the when the iPad was first announced for example I thought it was the dumbest move ever because we already had the iPhone we already had laptops why the hell do we need both well then you they created a market one. yeah well then no then you go play with one or then you find a need and you figure out the reason and without them saying here is this new cool piece of technology figure out how to use it it's in your hands. We are the general public to the tech community. Just like, and so see us as the company of music or of marimba playing. And without letting people be exposed to it, they can't learn about it or to like it. And I think we're, we actually unintentionally cripple audiences by judging them ahead of time. Whereas there are people who love cool 21st century music that is not tonal, but it's still good music, like Adam was saying in his post, and by not exposing them to that, they end up with an even narrower, and we're the ones to blame for that. We're the, their narrow perspective. Yeah, I, I like those thoughts. 
I also think too, like what about maybe we're focusing too much on the instrument, you know? Um, and we should be focusing more on the player, you know. Like Dave said, talking about what it is you're going to do, talking about not maybe even just about the piece, but why you chose the piece and how you play it. I mean, if we mm -hmm. focus more on the former, you know, I like to think that when I'm playing marimba, that's just what I choose to play that day to be expressive and musical, and it doesn't matter whether it's a vibraphone or a marimba. Or, you know, and if I could play trumpet just as well, I could express myself just as well with a trumpet. So maybe we're focusing too much on the instrument and need to focus more on the performer who's deciding, you know, this is what I'm trying to say through this group of pieces or through this piece or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know we've all listened to... Uh, yellow after the rain a million times or, you know, fill in the blank. You know, we like one performance a heck of a lot better than another, even though pretty much all the notes are the same, you know, and that's a performer difference. You know, that's what that musician, not marimba player or percussionist, brings to the table. You know? Right. I remember one of the things that the dean at IU said on the first day um, to all the music students, there was kind of this mass assembly thing, and his keynote was all about um, shifting the mentality from your specific in instrument to music, which most of us had already done as grad students, to being musicians versus just percussionists. But then taking it the next level, once you achieve that, you're actually an artist with, you know, and, and not that we all didn't know that intellectually, but what does that mean in how we approach what we do? Because I think there is a big difference when you remember that it's just a medium for artistry versus, you know, the sole thing that you know how to do. There's a big difference, I think. Well, I think that's where the marimba's at a huge disadvantage is it's so hard to gig with that thing. I mean, it's so hard to move <laughs> that thing. And I think Dr. G said, was talking about the financial aspect with it as well. Like, you know, say you're going to be, you're, you're going to say, hey, I'm going to go be a marimba performer. Well, your initial investment, you know, is thousands of dollars. And to make that back as a performer is tough, you know. And, right. you know, moving that thing is compared to moving a trumpet. It's not really a comparison. So. Yeah, my triangle paid for itself in the first gig. I don't know about your marimba. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a decade to pay that thing off. Yeah, I mean, there, that's, there's certainly lots of obstacles there, but if you think about a violinist who owns a Stradivarius, right? Yeah. They, they'll never pay that thing off, you know? Um, right. There's countless examples of that in the most absurd exaggeration, you know? Yeah. You can imagine when there's hundreds of thousands of dollars for a cello or whatever, you know. So I don't know how string players do it because even if you're, you know, even your concert master, you know, in whatever orchestra, you're not making that back, you know, in a couple lifetimes. You know, they, they actually, many of them have, maybe maybe what we need to do is find people that just, you know, rich people who want to own that and just let us play it, right? I mean, I guess that's what we have to do. <laughs> I think that's what a lot of string players do, yeah. you know. Yeah, so or I'm the curator. <laughs> I think Shane in general... Shane can finance us off. Yeah, no, I, I'm, Shane I'm cannot gonna, finance us off. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Yeah, he's in the business world, right, yeah. So, but I, but I think the idea that... I think we get very distracted, and I'm certainly just as guilty as the next guy, in our field, in our everyday life. We get distracted, we can forget about that, that we're just musicians, we're playing music, you know, and, and this is how we choose to express ourselves. And we focus on brand that we play, we focus on this controversy, or the script we play, whatever, you know, it's like all that stuff's important to some degree, but I think we, we, we live down in that space of too much, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I have a couple thoughts related. That actually reminds me, um, when I was at FSU, Dr. Parks used to talk about all the uh, assumptions we make no, he, doesn't, he doesn't play Miranda, though. He doesn't play. <laughs> well, <laughs> By the way, where's your where's your UT banner in the background? Oh, it's not. <laughs> well, I haven't graduated yet. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, okay. Adam, <laughs> oh, he needs to keep remembering that he hasn't graduated yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, sorry, no, Adam. Go ahead. <laughs> I remember. I remember Dr. Parks used to used to talk to us about how, you know, we make a lot of assumptions. Um, I mean. You know, you go to you go to a recital and you see somebody walk out, and there's a Malatech on stage, and they come out with their, you know, LS 15s or whatever. Maybe they're in a tuxedo, maybe not. And <laughs> and you know, they and they and you expect something without ever hearing them play. You already, you know, and based on whatever's on the program, you're already, you know, thinking ahead of how this is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, compare that to going to another recital and seeing, you know, uh, a Corey, you know, four and a third with, you know, kind of dinged up. Somebody walks out with mallets that, you know, the threads are, or the, you know, yarn is coming apart. They're playing cross grip. And, you know, that's a whole different set of expectations that I think we're all guilty of. Um, and, and yeah, so, I mean, and I think that carries over, you know, to the, to kind of what, we were talking about before with the with the music and the repertoire that we choose and how accessible it is in the sense that, you know, as musicians, I think, like Shane was saying, we're the worst ones about writing things off, um, you know, or having this mentality of certain music is better than other music or certain music is going to fall flat on its face. Um, and I think that can be, you know, remedied by sort of like Dr. Burrow was saying, you know, better performances. Um, I also really like what Dr. Gerhardt was talking about with, you know, good communication with the audience. I, you know, take the time to provide program notes for pretty much everything that I do now just because, you know, even I don't really like talking on stage so much, um, but, you know, I want to be able to tell the audience, you know, here's a little bit of kind of what you're in for um, and give them a little bit of background and hope that that's going to help them latch on to something a little bit more than they would otherwise. Um. Mm -hmm. I think we need to, I mean, you know, you may not like talking, but I think we need to make students do that more mm -hmm. because um, one of the things that I feel my weakness is um, outside of playing is is actually talking on stage and you know as the director now uh, running a steel drum program or, or a percussion ensemble just getting up on stage and talking is way harder than playing my instrument <laughs> and and if we can't talk about the music that we're playing and connect with the audience then you know we might as well just record CDs the rest of our lives and and never talk to an audience and I mean uh, that's one thing I was thinking about just kind of when I was saying we need to learn how to speak in front of the audiences and maybe maybe it's something that as professors we need to make our students do you know okay you're gonna talk about two pieces on your recital it doesn't have to be a lecture recital but like Tom was saying you know let's talk about why you picked this piece why it speaks to you why you programmed it you know and then maybe you know some tonal language or something a little more advanced for somebody you know so that you're hitting not just the mom and dads that are in the audience but also the clarinet player that you're dating or whatever <laughs> yeah well it's really funny it's interesting that you said that because i went to a high school senior recital for a vocalist um a few weeks ago um and surprisingly, I didn't want to leave. It was actually quite good. Um, There's not much to do in Iowa, is there, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> um, and there was, well, there was a family connection. So, uh, <laughs> um, but any event. She, but you're right, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and again, haven't you ever been cow tipping? I mean, there's there are things. Yeah. <laughs> been what? Cow tipping. <laughs> They don't, have cows in, they don't have cows in Southern California. Yeah. <laughs> that, we, we get the happy cow commercials. Then your cows to California, and we have happy cows. That's right. Uh, anyway. Um, anyway, I digress. The The recital was, um, it was, it was very good, but one of the things she did, and I was impressed just as a senior in high school, she actually broke down, um, I, I think it was like a da capo aria, and despite the not, I mean, it was not a musician audience, she still walked him through the formal structure of this is happening here and this is happening there and this is why and this is historically accurate and this is why I'm embellishing on the second pass. And huh. and, and so the, the average listener, she kept it pretty simple and pretty concise so that the average listener could still follow what she was saying. And I thought it went very well for, and maybe her recital, maybe her private teacher told her she had to, I don't know, but the, I thought it was very well received by a very uneducated, not uneducated in general, very musically uneducated audience. Right. Um, for example, one person in the audience was uh, called upon at a later date to pick a key 
because the the accompanist didn't know, and he called her vocal teacher and said, um, "Is this is she supposed to sing this as an A little B or B little B, being A flat or B flat?" <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the, I mean, the the level of education within the audience, but they still tracked and and it and it resonated. So I think there's a lot of value to that that connection. I do want to throw in that that people need to be very concise about it. There was a, a Truman jazz professor who shall not be named who was notorious for putting audiences to sleep with bad jokes, and <laughs> we would just be rolling our eyes on stage by the time he was done. So, yeah. so brevity is key. Yeah, and I think I think every performer has you know. Uh, different skill sets as far as communication. You know, Adam is a beautiful writer and, and is very eloquent in what he and how he communicates that way. Um, I can't write to save my life, so I just you know the things that I want to talk about in the audience are not like here's how I do a one in a roll. You know, they're always they're always very more general. <laughs> I appreciate that too. <laughs> yeah, well, they're all, they're all, they're, they're, they're very general. You know, they're just very general. So it almost you know comments like chain set comments that are almost you know, just what anybody can understand, you know. I mean, that's what people care about anyway, regardless of whether they're percussionists or just t general audience members. They want more general stuff. They want they want authentic sort of communication from you in, in whatever way that you feel most comfortable doing that. Because ultimately, a great performance, and, and you can, you guys, you know, you listeners out there too, you know, when when you're captivated, when you're manipulated by a performer, when you're taken somewhere by a movie or a painting or whatever, you know, I mean, that's what it's all about. So the more that you can break that wall down between the stage and the audience and, and invite them into your space, the, you know, the better that's going to go for you, you know. Right. Um, the other thing I would like to add to this discussion is uh, we all want the members to succeed and, you know, our forefathers <laughs> um, have, done, have done an incredible thing, right? I mean, we're talk we're having this conversation because of what the Gordon Stouts, Lee Stevens, the Keiko Abe's, and you know I'm sure I m forgot a bunch of people in there, but you know they really got us to this point, you know, and so what is our what is our legacy going to be as a generation, right? What are we going to do that's as significant as what our forefathers or whatever you want to call them have done, you know? I mean, what is it that we're, what is it that it's going to be, you know? And, and then because we have to do something, you know if we're going to move forward, and, and maybe it's, you know, we're, we're not going to see, obviously, in our own lifetimes, our instrument is way bigger than we are and will always be, but what is it and that our generation is going to leave um, as a legacy for the instrument? You know, I think that's something that, uh, you know, we, we've probably already seen that it could be repertoire, right? I mean, the boom of repertoire we've seen over the past 15, 20 years, maybe longer. Yeah. You know, that could be that could be part of the story, but um, and that's great, but we need to do at least that and more if we can. Mm -hmm. so, so here's a question way out in left field. Do you think that we are going to see more or less solo marimba players in the next 10 or 15 years? Or do you think people are going to be um, becoming more solo percussionists versus solo marimba players? I don't know. Have you seen the... Facebook marimba group, <laughs> they're fierce. <laughs> yeah, it seems, and it seems like there are more and more marimba players. Every you know, I don't yeah. know how many I see. Um, I, it seems to me anyway, from what I see, that I don't see as many people um, choosing other instruments. But it seems. I can just, speak, uh, oh, I can just speak to the Southern California thing. You know, I was at school in Long Beach for a couple of years, and I couldn't believe when I got out of there and got into the high school teaching scene how many incredible marimbas there are in Southern California. High school kids. I mean, young kids, like 16, just absolutely phenomenal. And there's, like, thousands of them. There's so many schools. Um, so I'd say, yeah, there's going to be... All those kids are obviously going to get older, and they probably won't all continue to play marimba, but there's going to be a huge boom of these kids coming through. So. Hmm. It's just interesting to think, like... I mean, you think of, and I'm not meaning this to be derogatory in any sense, but you think of the solo marimbas like um, our forefathers that you were talking about, <laughs> and 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 those people we we associate with them being just marimbas mostly. Right. Right. I mean, Lee, marimba. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't think of him playing snare drum. 
mm-hmm. which I'm sure he can, but I don't know. Um, you Gordon, I, was, I'm sorry. I mean, Gordon Stout, you think of him as playing marimba, although he plays percussion, but, you know, you think of him as a marimbas. But the guys that, or the people that have been coming out in the past five years, say, um, I don't know, uh, Thad Anderson, um, uh, I mean, just think of, like, college people that are teaching now. You think of them not just playing marimba and playing a multiple of instruments. Casey so Cangelosi. Casey Cangelosi, there's a perfect example. He's not just a marimba person. So I wonder if, if we are... Well, yeah, I mean... And, and I, don't, I don't want it to sound negative, and I don't want it to sound no, no, like but I'm what being what about, like, what about, like, Pius Chung, right? Yeah, but he's also an amazing timpanist. Uh, um, Even okay. that's what I've heard. Um, yeah, I guess I've heard that. Yeah. Even she um, was a timpanist. Right. I don't, I don't know how much she plays anymore, but and, and, she and then G G of Kansas, right? Yeah, she is a great snare drummer. Kevin Bobo is a phenomenal snare drummer. Yeah. He's basically good at everything he touches, but so why? So maybe the question is, yeah. So maybe the question is, why do people choose the marimba when they're equally? Or just as, I mean, yeah. Why do they? Well, for I think I really, I mean, I don't want to oversimplify, but it is of our instruments the one which captures every musical element at the same time. Right. Whereas everything else, you have to kind of pick and choose. Do I want to focus on melody, harmony, yeah, rhythm, so etc.? So, but that the outlet that marimba offers from that regards, not that you can't have it in other instruments, but it's right. just so blatantly obvious on the marimba. Right. It's also more accessible to an audience member. Like, you know, when I have students play a multi-solo on a recital versus a marimba solo, the mom mom or dad always comes up to me and says, oh, Johnny sounded great on whatever. But, See, w- you know, they never say, oh, yeah, the, the, the snare drum solo was my favorite. See, I'll challenge that. <laughs> I'll challenge that just because of my, my experience. And I'm not a good marimba, so that's probably why. But, like... My my best comments following my recitals were always regarding my multi solos. They just peep, my audiences ate those up. It, whether it was Raybons, whether it was uh, a 21st century composition. I mean, it was just everyone said, "Oh, I loved I loved that drummy piece," or "I loved right. that that little setup over there." Pl- that was really really cool. <laughs> um, so I think it varies on your audience. And yeah. what you're good at, frankly, because that's what I was better at that than Marimba by far. So that was probably part of it. Dave, I think, um, I think kind of to answer your question, I guess my opinion is that you know I don't know that there's going to be a particularly heavy percentage leaning towards the Marimba versus something else, but I think everybody that we just listed has something. Everybody, you know, the people that we know of. Um, and that are making names for themselves have something that they're kind of hanging their hat on. You know, for uh, you know Lee Stevens and Gordon Stout, that was marimba. You know, right. for Steve Schick, that was you know multi percussion, new music. Um, you know, you even mentioned Thad, and Thad is you know a big cage kind of scholarly academic um, expert, and that's kind of. I know he's, you know, really proud of that and has, you know, contributed a lot as far as that. And so I think everybody that's coming out, you know, is finding kind of their niche. And for some people, it happens to be marimba. For other people, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of different things just, you know, uniquely suited to those people's personalities or their interests or, you know, maybe their upbringing or, or whatever. But I think that you know, everybody at some point has to find, you know, that thing that they want to, you know, kind of put their eggs in that basket or kind of be known for. And they can be great at lots of other things. But I think most most people, you know, are associated with something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I think it's probably, it's great, right, that, um, that that's the case, that it doesn't, you don't have, you know, you just, you can do a lot of different things well and be known for something, and that can, you can be. This guy can be just as successful as a scholar uh, or a percussion soloist as someone else can be as a performer. You know, for me, my favorite excuse is since I just really can't do anything but play marimba, is just you know, I can I can play with four sticks. That's all I can do. You know? Well, I think I mean even even <laughs> I, and I think it's I think it's irresponsible to expect us to do anything else because 
there isn't another industry in the world where you don't end up with some sort of specialty. So like like a doctor, you don't. Call, I mean, your right. orthopedic surgeon could give you a physical, like, <laughs> but you don't call him for that. Right. Just just like yeah, you know, Tom, you could play the triangle for Browns four, but we don't call you for that. <laughs> Wow. Wow. That makes me sad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't do anything else, but I, I think I could do that. <laughs> he could play it with four sticks. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's true. <laughs> Great. Well, is there anything, <laughs> anything else you want to? Uh, is there any other issues we need to address with all this? It's a good discussion. No, it's great. I think this is a great medium to do this. We should do this more often. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, uh, listeners, if you're watch or watching, if you're listening to this. After the fact, we're using Google Hangouts, um, which is a basically a nice video platform here, sort of video conference. Um, we're going to talk about whether we want to, what we're going to do with this technology. This is sort of the first time we've used it, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, we kind of had some surprise viewers, so they just kind of popped in, and I couldn't see who they were. So if that was you, yeah, and we didn't really for coming in live. We, we didn't, didn't really invite really them either. So <laughs> yeah. And yeah, exactly. We didn't really but publicize it. Was public, it. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. They didn't like hack in. So yeah, we also have to, we have to announce the book chatter winners. I'll go for it. Oh yeah, let's do it. Drum roll, please. <laughs> uh, so in first place, with 48% of the vote, No Such Thing as Silence, Cage and 433 by Kyle Gann. Nice. And then in second place, Public Parts by Jeff Jarvis. Yeah, sweet. sweet. So it worked out that we got a music book and a business book, and we didn't have to... You know, that was all the results. Picked. Yeah. <laughs> so is our plan to do both those, or? Yeah, let's do both of them. Um, I think I'll post I'll post it up on the site tonight. But um, you know, if you guys want to start getting those books, and I'll put links on the website for those books. And I think Adam volunteered to do the cage, right? And Jake's doing the the private parts. Well, is that <laughs> we're, just, we're just bowing public out, parts. right? <laughs> private parts, huh? Oh, yeah. public parts, not private, private parts. Yeah. <laughs> That's Howard Stern. <laughs> <laughs> not that kind of show. <laughs> That's actually why Jeff. Uh, it's kind of an homage to. Uh, yeah, Howard. exactly. Yeah, uh, he's they a huge Howard fan. Right, exactly. Yeah. I didn't know that's why you guys invited me here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's a so trap. So, uh, but I do. I want to say on the on the podcast here, thanks to Jake and uh, Adam for. Yeah, we really appreciate uh, it. for Thank guest hosting at Drum Chatter. Um, and you know, if you're out there and you have some stuff you want to say, we're always open to, you know, um, other people that want to post at our site. Um, so we really especially appreciate on, you guys especially doing. on Mondays when anyone wants anything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, guys. Keep doing what you're doing. It's really great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So I guess that's our podcast for today. Um, you can follow. Be sure to follow Drum Chatter at Drum Chatter. You can follow me at T Burrett, two R's two T's, and Shane. Yours is again. Uh, Shane P Griffin. Okay. And Dave. I am D R Gearhart. Doctor right. Gearhart. And you. Th- what? Hey, and hey, a- Adam Guys. Yeah, what about Adam and... Adam, what's your Jake? handle, Twitter? Yeah. Uh, AG Percussion. AG Percussion and Jake? Jay Cummings Music. Sweet. Yeah. Well, thanks and again, guys. Yeah, is there anything that Adam and Jake, you guys want to you guys want to push quick? Uh, wanna, you want to plug it all, your site, or something you're up to? Uh, no? I'm going out <laughs> to Bangalore in three weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so Sweet. looking forward to that. That'll be good times. Englewood. <laughs> Other than that, everybody get ready to see UT play. But no your problem. blog is a state of the art, right? Yeah. That's right. Congrats to the UT studio and, and Tom for getting invited to PASIC. Does that mean we have to play a concert there? <laughs> oh, God. No. <laughs> no, we're obviously super excited about that. So, All right. Well, that's our podcast for today. We thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, and we'll see you next time. All right.